So let me just take a brief moment to uh, introduce Mark Warner, our next, next speaker. He's got an absolutely remarkable record. Uh, for 20 years, he was a uh, successful uh, business leader and investor. In fact, he co-founded the company that became Nextel, and he's invested in literally hundreds of uh, startups and created tens of thousands of jobs. Uh, he's been the governor of Virginia, and when he left the governorship in 2006, Virginia was ranked as the best state for business, the best managed state, the best state in which to read a, receive a public education. Uh, he moved on to the Senate, where he's been since 2000. And, eight, and he's been a bipartisan leader there, um, known for working well with both Republicans and Democrats. Um, I've known him by reputation, as many of us probably have, for, for a decade or more. But I've gotten to know him a little bit personally in the past year. And, and I'd say he's, uh, he's one of the most uh, thoughtful and insightful leaders in the Senate. Or actually, scratch that. That's not exactly right. He's, uh, I think he is the most thoughtful and insightful leader in the, in the Senate, So uh, at least in my, my humble opinion. And uh, I have some, some bad news and some good news. He's, he is, the bad news is that he's not running for president, so we're going to have to make do with our existing crop of uh, candidates, at, at least this cycle. Um, but the good news is he's here today to share some of his thinking on this topic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Senator Mark Warner. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you for that very kind introduction. It is great to be here, great to be at MIT. Um, I am you know, playing a little bit of hooky from my day job at this point. Uh, so I'm anxious to make my presentation and uh, if time allows, take a couple questions, but um, I've got to get back to saving the Republic, <clears throat> which uh, may or may not be what's uh, going on all the time on the Senate floor. It is, um, I really want to thank you for including me in these conversations. I, I think about it as uh, you and Dave and others came up and, and talked a bit. Um, I normally give this presentation to people who, frankly, uh, are just being introdu introduced to this topic. So well, I had dinner with you last night and talked about reworking my comments. I may kind of rework them midstream again because you've already kind of hit uh, on, on some of the points I wanted to make. Um, you know, I think I was one of the first elected officials in Washington to kind of stride into this area about a year ago, first started getting interested in it. And as a former venture capitalist, as, as Eric mentioned, I knew I was kind of in the right space when we hadn't even decided what to call this part of the economy. I remember talking one of the early times to Sarah Horowitz, and you know, is it the on-demand economy? Is it the gig economy? Ace over there is the 1099 economy. Is it the on-demand sharing? Uh, as a former VC, when you don't have a title for an area, that's a good space to be in. Um, I think we're starting to see some coalescence uh, around on-demand. But clearly, um, what we are seeing is what I think is one of the most radical transformations in our workforce in uh, many, many decades. And as somebody who was got involved in the cellular telephone business back in the early 80s and was told by all of my law school classmates I was crazy to, to, to be involved in cell phones, um, I went on to form Nextel. They're still practicing law, uh, which also means that I will be the only uh, speaker today that says, even when I'm speaking, go ahead and leave your cell phones on. <laughs> Doesn't bother me at all. Um, matter of fact, if they go off, you hear an annoying sound and I hear cha-ching, cha-ching. So especially now that I'm a federal worker. Um, but as I, you know, as I was getting into this over the last year, there were a couple of things that, uh, that hit me. Uh, first, you know, I saw from my three millennial aged daughters um, a completely different intersection with technology than even I had. They are totally comfortable with all forms of technology, but they're also totally comfortable with disruption. And that is a, a transformation that we've seen building, but really uh, is just starting to play out in a major way. Um, what, we, what I also saw is that, um, uh, that this movement into the on-demand economy while in many ways being shaped by millennials, and I've had probably 10 town hall meetings around my state with on-demand sharing economy workers, is not just about millennials. I've seen many, many baby boomers, Gen Xers and others, many of them disrupted by the recession, who maybe not by choice, but now are in this sector of the economy. And uniformly, I found that nobody wanted to go back to the old structure. 
Now, that may be a self-selection of the folks who would come out, uh, but on you know, 10 town hall meetings, it would usually take an increase in salaries of up to a third to get them to think about going back to the old structure. As a policymaker, it made me realize that one of the things that I think that we have underestimated is that in our complex world, how much people want the freedom and flexibility to have some control over their own life. Uh, candidly, again, one of the things that is dramatically different from where we were in the old economy. Um, the challenge we've got is, is as more and more policymakers start to get into the sector, how do we, how do we get it right? How do we allow the innovation, but also recognize that we've got to maintain consumer protections and we've got to make sure that workers are treated fairly. Now, I don't think these three goals of maintaining innovation, treating consumers fairly, and making sure workers get a stake are necessarily contradictory. It is going to require some collaboration. It is going to require a forward thinking. Um, and that forward thinking is going to mean not simply trying to reproduce the 20th century labor framework, or simply relitigating labor classifications of the 20th century. It really is about how we can get more people access to these tools, access to the innovation, access to these footholds into a changing economy. And again, that's why I think it's so important what's happening here at MIT and why this kind of conversation, my hope as I'll go along, is that I can urge a sense of urgency to these kind of conversations and these dialogues. Because, candidly, if we don't have that sense of urgency, chances are policymakers will get it wrong. Um, how did I get involved in this in the first place? Well, I, I saw as I was traveling around Virginia, and particularly, again, as I mentioned with millennials, when you were asking people what they were doing, and I would hear my daughters talk, it was no longer, hey, where do you work? It was much more, what are you working on? This notion that you are working on a, not just one, but two or three or four projects at once, that you might have a variety of income streams coming in to making your, uh, uh, making in effect your life work, was something that has been tremendously different. As I mentioned, this is not just something that's affecting millennials, it's affecting Gen Xers, baby boomers. And uh, if we're gonna be honest, while we are celebrating the ability to kind of monetize our time or our apartment, or our um, cars in ways that have been unprecedented. Uh, the idea that you're gonna have three or four different gigs to get by, for a whole lot of Americans, particularly low and moderate income Americans, they kind of roll our eyes when we're thinking this is new because getting by with two or three separate jobs has been called poor for a long, long time. And part of our challenge here is to make sure that, that we get this right in a way where that definition of cobbling together three or four different gigs at the same time doesn't necessarily relate in that. Now, what do we need to do? One, we need to make sure we've got better data. Uh, and candidly, I know yesterday you had some reviews of, of where we stand on the data. I, I'm anxious to get a full download on what was discussed yesterday. Uh, but we don't have very good data. Some of the data that we've seen kind of flies all over the line. Um, last December, uh, Time Magazine and Burston Marsteller did a 3,000 person online survey. They showed, now again, there was some self-selection in that survey, but they literally showed that 44% of Americans had accessed some type of on-demand service over the past two years. They showed as well that 22% of Americans had actually offered an on-demand service over the last two years. Now, that's different than simply offering to sell something on eBay. These were more what we would call in the on-demand economy. To me, those numbers seemed high, but even if they were high in December, we're still at the hockey stick component of the growth in this sector of the economy. So they, have, they may have been high in December. We're definitely headed that direction. As well, I think many of you may have seen some of the data that's come out from the JP Morgan survey of, I think it was a close to a quarter million customers on their credit card reporting. One of the things that 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 information showed that I thought was uh, perhaps explaining some of the political dysfunction that's going on in our country today is it showed that literally 55% of those Americans, these were not simply on-demand Amer uh, Americans, but literally 55% of those Americans showed that they had more than a 30% volatility in their income month to month. That's a fascinating statistic. 
uh, I think for me, it explains that one of the great challenges that we have in our country right now is not only income inequality, but income insecurity. When you've got that much volatility in your income, again, unprecedented, uh, and we've got to figure out ways to sort through. Second thing we've got to understand is policymakers in Washington, and I get a presentation to a series of Democratic senators recently uh, on the on-demand economy, and hope to do the same on a series of Republican senators shortly. Um, I think we, when we start talking about labor classifications in this whole sector, uh, there are many, many policymakers at both the federal level, state level, and increasingly also at the lo local level that just don't understand this transformation. And the concern um, that I have is if we don't act with a sense of urgency, uh, these very same policymakers may be starting to make policy in major ways that doesn't get it right, that tries to simply fit all of, of these challenges back into a 20th century framework. So yes, uh, my couple of ask of all of you, and uh, I've been involved, I'm active in a project called The Future of Work uh, that is being directed through the Aspen Institute, and we've got folks from the Future of Work project here and folks from my staff who will be here for the, the whole day even after I leave. If you are policymakers, if you are funders, if you are academics, uh, we need your help getting this right. Because uh, if we don't get it right, chances are leaving it to the traditional political process we'll get it wrong. So what do we need specifically? One, we do need more data. Uh, we need it yesterday. Uh, we need to figure out how ways that we can get at it as quickly as possible. From the governmental standpoint, I think as probably most of you know, uh, the last time the federal government looked at this area of contingent work was 2005. That's about as useful as the, the data was from 1895 in terms of how we're, the subject we're talking about. Uh, I am happy to report that uh, we did get in the last budget uh, the ability to push the um, Labor Secretary and the BLS to actually uh, um, move forward on a new contingent work survey. I'm not sure it's gonna be complete enough, but I think that is a step in the right direction. But we need more, more data from the private sector as well. Uh, one other thing I mentioned last night at the dinner, uh, a small step in the right direction. As we think of folks within the existing 1099 economy, and not just in the on-demand space, but uh, any kind of other sole proprietors and others, the IRS, until this year, was still not taking any kind of the expense data that would come in in anything other than paper forms. So we were able to work over the last few weeks and get the IRS to start allowing electronic transformation, uh, Atlant electronic transmittal of this kind of information. A small step forward, but where I work, we count those as at least singles in uh, today's world. Um, second thing that I think we, um, or th third thing I think that we need to recognize is that, and it's been mentioned already, we really have a chance here to reimagine the whole new social contract. For 75 years, we had a social contract, not only in this country, but I know Johannes will probably speak uh, a little bit later, in, in most of, of the West, our social contract was slightly different than that in Europe. It grew out of the employment relationship, but it grew up in the 30s and the 40s. Um, and it provided a level of security that uh, worked pretty well. Unemployment, disability, workman's comp, health insurance, some level of retirement. But we've seen that social contract, quite honestly, at least over the last 30, 40 years, slowly erode. My father worked for the same company for 40 years. He didn't make a lot of money, but he did have the guarantee that he, when he retired or if he got sick or if he got hurt, there would be that set of benefits. That was kind of the post-World War II generation. My generation, as a baby boomer, has lived more in the less than the defined benefit and more in the defined contribution world. And while we might, we are at the front end of, of uh, globalization and technology, and we might move from three to four jobs during our careers, it was still not as much of a radical transformation. But starting in many ways in the 1990s, as globalization and technology swept through our whole economy, we saw more and more firms start to outsource, not literally in terms of overseas, but outsource any function that was not core to the company's mission. So in large corporates, more and more often, 
the cafeteria staffs, the janitorial staffs, and others would no longer receive the benefit packages that existed working in the traditional workplace, but more and more often fell into a subcategorization, oftentimes without any of that level of social contract. And now we see in the on-demand economy, particularly as we think about this in this binary 1099 W-2 context, more and more people, particularly those falling on the 1099 side, operating with absolutely no social contract at all. And what I hope we could do is actually use this opportunity to rethink that social contract for the 21st century. And in many ways, if we reimagine this in the right way, the gig on demand sharing economy may actually be the point on the spear to get this right. Now, how do we do it? One, recognizing that many of you who are on the platform side here, you know, are appropriately concerned with litigation threats and local legislation threats about leaning in. We've got to move past that. Uh, we've got six, within the Aspen Institute, we've got six to eight cities, and I think we can get more, who are very interested in being innovation zones, where we can try out a series of pilots on offering a variety of benefits. It may not be the full safe harbor that some of you want, but we've got to take advantage of that opportunity to try some experimentation, number one. Number two, we need to recognize that this is almost an unprecedented opportunity uh, to rethink that traditional social contract. So even if we could imagine a world and try innovations where, where we can try different types of benefit packages, training, assistance, and others to people in the on-demand economy, if we simply port the 20th century benefit package to the 21st century, candidly, I don't think we're going to get it right. When you choose when to work, the whole notion of unemployment insurance or vacation time is a bit of a foreign concept. So as we think about um, taking advantage of this innovation, I think we really need to, to rethink uh, the component parts of the social contract. And third, one of the areas that I have gotten particularly interested in uh, over the last couple of months is, you know, can we actually en engage as we think about this new social contract and put up that whiteboard and imagine it? Can we engage with folks in the fintech community on how we might reimagine what some of these benefits would, would look like? I personally believe they'll end up being portable as opposed to attached to employment. I think they will travel with the individual. My hope is that they will come if you have one, two, three, four different sources of income. They'll come uh, complete with little streams of income that come from all of your specific gigs. As we think about the fintech world, could we imagine sets of benefits that don't currently exist, like income smoothing, like having an emergency uh, fund that you could draw upon when the stuff hits the fan, as it always does at some point, particularly in low and moderate income people's lives on a regular basis. Could we engage with that community uh, to, in a sense, I hope the FinTech community who will disrupt some of the fin larger financial institutions the same way that we've seen ride sharing disrupt taxis and Airbnb and hosting firms disrupt hotels, can we think about engaging the FinTech as we reimagine this social contract? Now, what is this? What is, why, do, why is there an urgency in this? Um, one is because, in a sense, as I think about this transformation in the workforce, um, uh, my friend Lindsey Graham, a uh, senator from South Carolina, he got stuck with me on a, like an hour ride recently. And he, you know, he got my full download, with, uh, which I've skipped through here. You know, he got from A to Z, Sarah, the whole presentation with data down. And you know, after the whole hour, uh, one of the great attributes that Lindsay has is he's able to take a much better than me, a complicated idea and kind of boil it down. And he said, Mark, what you're saying is happening in work is basically like what happens to all of us as Americans in terms of buying our cable TV. It used to be you'd had to buy the whole cable package and get all those other channels because you wanted HBO and ESPN and you didn't really want the rest. And now suddenly we can start buying on an a la carte basis HBO and ESPN. In a sense, that's the same thing that's happening in work. It used to be you had to buy the whole human package for a 40 hour at least week. And now you can actually buy on demand a la carte 
individual services. And we see this at one point now kind of in, as we, we know, some of the areas of delivery and ride share and hotel sharing and others. But this is going to come across all sectors of the economy, this ability to purchase a la carte. As we mentioned before, that offers opportunities for flexibility and innovation. But it also means if we don't get it right, um, the, the challenges in terms of, of having even more disruption in our system are going to exponentially grow. So what do we need? One, uh, to reiterate, we do need from you all the notion that we can't study this forever. Uh, we need those of you who are willing to engage with us in this discussion. We need your help. We need your money. We need your energy. We need your ideas. Two, we need. And I think we can produce this from the local government and state government part, and even somewhat from the federal government part, some willingness to partner with those of you who are platform companies who are willing to step out and try some experimentation. Three is that we really do need real-time efforts on rethinking this social contract and letting them, working with us on how we can bring about those kind of policy changes. Because if not, Here's, here's potentially what's going to happen. One is, as elected leaders who are not informed, we're going to get this wrong. If we allow this issue to divert and divulge back into traditional <coughs> Democrat-Republican, we're going to be up the creek. You know, the wonderful opportunity here is this is really an issue that is more future past rather than left right. Um, but we've got to make sure that we, we, we act with a sense of urgency. Within 10 months, you know, Within 10 months, and actually sooner in terms of the election, you're not going to have to watch any more of the presidential election. <laughs> and if you don't think that there's a lot at stake, if you don't think that our current political dialogue is pretty brain dead, then I would simply urge you to turn on some of the, the, the things that have passed this debate over the last few days, or some of the comments and some of the agendas that are being laid out, quite honestly, by leaders in both political parties, neither one of which seem to be really leaning into the future. So, well, you can say, well, what does all that mean? Well, one is, you know, within the next 11 months, 10 months actually, there's going to be a new president. There's going to be a new Congress. There's going to be that first 100 days of action. Whether you like it or not, by the time the new president comes, there, this issue of benefits and social contract and the whole notion of the gig and on-demand economy is going to be front and center. So if we're not ready with policy ideas, if we're not ready with some experimentation, then chances are this is going to be relitigated on 20th century terms. Secondly, and this is a, another area of where we're working on the, in the, the Aspen project, is that you know, as somebody who's benefited a great deal from American capitalism, I have to tell you, I don't believe American capitalism, with its focus on short-termism, is really serving the vast majority of Americans right now. And I know we've got academics here, and you're going to say, well, what's your data? I will simply give you my two data points, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and if we can't find a way for a more inclusive capitalism or a, a more responsible capitalism or more conscientious capitalism, if we can't find a way to brand this, to incent this kind of behavior, then quite honestly, it may not only be walls with different countries that we're building, but it may be a whole series of other walls. One of the attributes that will take place, at least early next year, will be tax reform and at least international tax reform. So there'll be opportunities to actually engage with the business community in a completely different way about incenting investment in human capital. Quite honestly, not to go off too far off script here, but you know, we have a current tax and regulatory system that totally favors capital over labor on virtually every occasion. And for a long time, when we had you know, abundance of labor and shortage of capital, that worked. But as we think we most of us know in the West for the last 30 years, we've got abundance of capital. We've got shortage of qualified labor. Yet we don't have the investments or the policies set up to actually make investment in human capital in terms of pay and training 
particularly for low and moderate income Americans, a high enough priority. We'll have opportunities to try major experiments, particularly using the reform of the tax code in ways that are beyond unprecedented. But to be ready for that, and then we talked specifically about an opportunity last night, to be ready for that, we really need your help now. Um, I know I'm in a, a world-class uh, educational institution, and um, uh, I don't want to offend anyone at MIT or, or at any of the other great institutions that you, you come from. But this cannot be a problem that we form a committee to start thinking about, to plan a study that we would then, you know, potentially published next summer. You know, this is coming at us real time. The level of frustration in the American people is at an unprecedented high level. If we get this right, in terms of the innovation around the on-demand economy, if we see this as a way for people to step into the economy in unprecedented ways, if we can rework that social contract, if we can think about using tools like tax reform as a way to re-incent businesses to think more responsible, then that, the opportunity in our country, and frank, quite honestly, the thing that makes America, I think, distinctively different is that at least until recent times, we've all been, always been willing to kind of lean in when we see a problem. We're going to have that opportunity come early next year. Uh, the Aspen Institute project, which is bipartisan, it has been uh, Mitch Daniels, the former governor of Indiana and current president of Purdue, is uh, my, my co-chair on it. Um, we want to try to line up a series of bipartisan policies in both of these buckets so that whomever is the next president, they will be ready and that we can actually advance them into the reality. So the work that you're going to do today is extraordinarily important. Uh, the work that's already been done has helped move the ball. We just got to make sure that we don't allow this, you know, this opportunity uh, to be diverted into a 20th century liberal versus conservative kind of argument. So my thanks for being here. Be happy to take a couple questions. But Eric, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you all. For some questions, so there's a couple of microphones here. I see people are leading, lead, uh, lining up. So please go ahead and, and use the microphone. We start over here with Michael. Quick question, Senator Warner. You're a serious guy, <laughs> Mitch Daniels, very serious guy. When you had Lindsey Graham gave a serious response, what portion of the conversation in Washington with policymakers that you have would you characterize as serious versus unserious? In the age of digital, where all your comments will be re remembered forever, I'm going to give you a partial punt answer. Um, I have socialized both the on-demand economy and the notion of trying to make capitalism work for a broader group of people. The opportunity in both these issues is they don't fall on the traditional Democrat-Republican line. And the vast majority of policymakers of both parties know we're not getting it right. You know, it's not rocket science to figure out the American people are pretty upset at the established political class. What we've got to be able to do, and the opportunity, I think I don't want to overstate this, but I really think the opportunity here is to set a new framework about an economy that's coming whether we like it or not. And if we get ahead of it with some policy ideas, we might, not ha we might have the opportunity not to have this divert to, to red team versus blue team. Mm. And I, I believe with all my heart that there will be, there will be even with the existing Congress, you know, significant majorities that would vote in favor of these policies. Senator, in the industrial economy, people tended to associate safety nets with socialism and hmm. capitalism was viewed much more as a more less as fair attitude. In the digital economy, the best way to encourage entrepreneurship and free market capitalism seems to be to provide the safety nets that will enable individuals to go ahead and invent their own jobs. So the ideology has been totally turned around. Is that a correct way of thinking about this? I think there are um, clearly models, European models, where the benefits come with citizenship or residency. In America, 
social contract has always been tied to employment. I don't think, back to the earlier question, that we're going to see a transformation where we're going to dramatically increase revenues to provide a much larger government-based social safety net. But I do think there is an ability for even some of the most conservative members of the Congress to realize if you have a large percentage of the workforce that is existing with no social insurance at all, that you've got a classic free rider problem, that when bad things happen, they then come back upon taxpayer dime supported programs. And those, candidly, in our country are historically low and at the lowest rate of investment that we've had in decades in those programs. You know, outside of Medicare and Social Security, all of the rest of the programs, literally on domestic discretionary income, are being cut in half from the Bush 07 levels. We're on that kind of trajectory. I don't think it's a good business plan for our country, but that's the world we're living in. And yes, I do think you will see in this on-demand economy more ability for people to be entrepreneurs. I support that. And that's why I, again, believe that the ultimate answer will lie with, with more portable portability of benefits. But the idea that kind of the, I believe, Pollyannish idea that every individual is going to be this self-supporting entrepreneur, that he or she is going to be able to make it totally on their own without any social insurance, I think is complete fantasy. Senator, as you've gone around the um, S Senate talking about this new thing called the on-demand economy, can you let us, can you give us some idea of what the conversations have been like with your colleagues, the kinds of questions you've got back, the responses you've heard, and are you more struck by how similar or different they are on the two sides of the aisle? I don't think this is where it gives me hope. I don't think there's major difference between on both sides of the aisle. I mean, there is on a normal kind of sense on the Republican side to more just say, celebrate the innovation. Uh, but I'm, I'm struck, and I, I guess I, I shouldn't be, you know, uh, because a year ago plus, I was not that familiar, as we kind of immediately divert to labor classifications <clears throat> and 21-point tests between 1099 and W-2, most of the members don't get that. I think most members are, would be surprised to realize that you know, existing platform companies can't even provide training without the threat that it might you know, cross them up. I think most, most folks also uh, don't fully understand that we really are only presenting a binary choice based upon a 20th century framework. I think there is a lot of interest in reimagining a social contract and you know, again, with the current um, makeup of the Congress, I think there's a real interest in reimagining a social contract that may be portable. And who runs that portable benefits package? You know, I don't believe it can be opt-in. I think it has to be have you know, more substance than that. Uh, there may be an opt-out component. But who runs that package? You know, offers, I, I think if we stay flexible with that, and whether it's new platforms, new associations, new guilds, new forms of unions. I mean, I think that offers a great, great ability to kind of, again, to attract people from both sides. But there's a lot of education to be done. You know, uh, there is um, most, quite honestly, most of the members' knowledge of this space is limited to a conversation they had with an Uber driver. <laughs> but, uh, to, you know, there's been a number of my colleagues who've caught up when I was kind of, Sarah was there when we were making the presentation, when some of the younger members stood up and say, you know, if you don't believe this is big, go back and ask all of your staff, not only how many of them are using these services, but how many of them are offering these services because the job in the Senate doesn't pay them enough to get by. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think one of the issues that you brought up in terms of really looking at this uh, Frame, large frameworks to address the new evolving situation. I think we also need to be mindful of psychology of work. As work gets disrupted, um, work is not only a means of income, but it's a way of addressing a lot of psychological and social needs of individuals, uh, self-efficacy or identity. So I think in the big framework, we need to also look at this uh, issue around psychology of work as well. 
I would, I would agree with that. And, that. and that's where I made the comment that I think Jonas will say earlier that people at age 27 strive for stability. But I also found as a policymaker, I had underestimated how much people, because of the complicated world, love the ability to kind of have some flexibility with their schedule. And I think one of the things that we've got to realize that with the cliff that we created in Obamacare between 29 and 30 hours, and with the same algorithmic scheduling that brings you that Uber, can also allow, especially if you're a low-end worker, the ability to be on on-demand scheduling all the time so you never know when you're going to work, that simply saying the current W-2 status is the right answer because uh, there's an awful lot of people getting the short end of the stick under that structure. Ace? Yeah. For, I'll take these last three and then get out of your hair. For one, I will, I will volunteer to run that opt-in or opt-out program, so <laughs> I'm happy to do it. Um, you talked a little bit about your work with the Aspen Institute and some of the cities that you guys are getting on board to be pseudo-safe havens for innovation and, and testing and, frankly, breaking things. Um, do you think on a lot larger scale there's a willingness to have a conversation about how, how much we push the envelope on the state all the way up to the IRS, which I think a lot of our problems are happening? I think we're not going to do this in a single bite. I think we have six to eight cities, and I think as a former governor, I've still got great ties with governors, but you almost have to get the city to volunteer first and, and then c collaborate with the state. I think we, you know, I, I made mention of the small incremental change on at least being able, and since your business is about expenses, uh, uh, painless 1099, um, having that ability to do it online as opposed to through paper receipts is a small step in the right direction. But if we don't, if we don't get the platforms, companies, to lean in as well, uh, then we're going to miss an opportunity. And I would simply add that this space, my editorial comment here, was red hot the first nine months of 2015, is slightly less hot from an investor standpoint right now. And as we see some of the press on this start to change, um, you could see policymakers being pushed, trying, uh, because the press is starting to change on it, you, pushing this simply back into a 20th century framework. That's not a good answer. So we, we need some of that same risk taking to um, take place from the platform companies if I can bring you some of the cities who will take some risks as well. Yes. Hi, Senator. Um, I, I actually was going to ask you to say a little bit more about this local experimentation that you're imagining. We have a number of um, uh, folks in the room that might be able to help move that forward. So. You say you have six to eight cities that are ready. You're imagining a constellation of platform companies, policy makers. Would more traditional businesses also be involved? Who else would be involved in this? I, I think what how we, quickly could that, could that actually get going? I think it could get going at least in terms of uh, a framework mm -hmm. very quickly. Again, cities are the fastest place to move. You know, we've been having some of these conversations for months. Um, Connor McKay from Aspen in the back. Connor, raise your hand. Maureen from my office over here. David Roth over here. You know, there are groups of us who've been working on this for some time. You know, we need more ideas, more resources. We need uh, we need the platform companies to step up. I think we've now got the cities willing to step up. Um, uh, but I think you know, whether it's we talked a little bit last night. You, a, an expanded black car fund that's already got a model in New York. Some of the things that Sarah Horwitz is talking about doing in New York, even with the existing structure. We can get, we can start these initiatives, but we can't spend, the time for the dance is over, the time to start actually moving forward is now. So you're imagining kind of a design prototyping that would be very I'm imagining very design prototypes time. that could actually be implemented by late summer. By late summer. But only if we move quickly, obviously. Uh, what you've described in terms of the, of the on-demand economy is really internal reconfiguration. Both political parties have targeted trade as a major deleterious thing that's going on in terms of losing jobs, losing competitiveness. How does your vision of the on-demand economy fit in with whether you recommend, whether you would expand, whether you would change the nature of trade? 
This sounds like a po political town hall now. So, uh, um, you know, I, I, I believe America can compete in a global economy. I've supported trade, uh, trade policy. I've supported TPP. I think you've got to have a level playing field. I don't think we can put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, but I think what we find, and, and you know, the on-demand sector of the workforce, I don't believe this is not just an American phenomenon. This is happening all over the world. And I don't think we're going to be able to reverse the trend. But <clears throat> having that trend of work without some level of benefits, I think, does not paint an appropriate fu uh, uh, future. I also believe that we have to think about how capitalism works in a more works for more people in our country. And that is not simply as companies outsource jobs abroad. It also means outsourcing non-core functions into independent contractor status within their existing workforce that'll never be abroad. Your janitorial worker, your cafeteria worker is not going abroad. But as companies, many of the larger ones are, you know, standing up applauding themselves for raising at least their core worker's salary, then if you ask them what happens to all the folks in their supply chain, you don't get so good an answer. So trade is a component part of this, and I'm supportive, but I also think we've got to, we've got to change some of the overall incentives in our current capitalism system. But you do have differences in trade rules. You have different degrees of free riding that goes on that inevitably have cost some nations jobs and profits. I don't quite see how the on-demand economy is going to enhance our position trades-wise. I believe that many of the, at least in the existing on-demand framework, the job functions that have been most affected are the ones that will be least affected by trade. You know, if you're thinking about delivery or, uh, you know, hotels, taxi, others. Now, I think it will go up the food chain. We're starting to see already. Uh, there was a great story in the Washington Post the other day about how this is affecting the legal business. Um, but I do, and I do think there's ways that we've got to argue for a more level playing field than sometimes has been the case. And I can tell you, as somebody who um, has advocated uh, the, um, some of the benefits for trade, I can also take you to parts of my state, the southern tier of my state, which were, was tobacco, textiles, and furniture it's awfully hard to continue to make that case in those communities. One of the things that we have done dreadfully bad, and under both sets of administrations, is those communities that have been hurt by trade, having appropriate training and other incentives to bring new jobs back to those communities. Quite honestly, we've been, I think, too often dismissive of this is just the, you know, part of the cost of doing business. Well, as we start to see that cost seep into more and more communities and higher and higher up the food chain, I think you're, that's one of the reasons why you're seeing in both political parties so much blowback now on trade. We've got to figure out how to do that better. And part of that means having a structure within capitalism that means that the that an investment in a piece of equipment, which is an asset, and the investment in a human individual, which is a cost, needs to be reversed a little bit. And investing in human capital, both from a, a pay and training standpoint, and there are tools within the tax code to do this, and we'll have some opportunities around tax reform. There's a whole series of movements now around trying to uh, respond in terms of consumer behavior on, on more responsible capitalism. There's a whole conscientious capitalism movement. There's the B Corp movement. There's a just capital movement. There is the whole ESG activities. So one bucket is how we get, and we have to hope for millennials, who want to buy from and work with more responsible companies. What can we do from, from tax and other policies? What can we do from investor behavior? There's an awful lot of investors, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, who've said they would love to invest in more responsible enterprises. Well, they've used the DOL fiduciary duty ERISA pro uh, challenge as a reason why they can't. Well, so that's changing. We're looking at other changes around the definition of fiduciary duty that can say not only short-term shareholder value, but also the value of your employees. I think there is an opportunity here to get this right. And I know I'm with a lot of academics. Uh, I will come back again. If you don't believe this is, is a challenging issue for our country, simply turn on the television and watch the political debate. Thank you all very much. Please help us in this.